Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. And it's uh, actually, I hadn't expected this many people in the talk, so <laughs> because uh, I've, I've given this talk before at Pike and Italia, it was kind of the same and also the same kind of expectation. So I was wondering why people are, are so interested in this. And we're going to get to that in the talk. I'm first going to uh, give you a short introduction of what event-driven architectures are all about. And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about how you can use Python for these things. So first, a, a bit of a speaker introduction. Um, I'm Mark Lemberg. I am based in Düsseldorf in Germany. I have a consulting company, a Python consulting company. We're currently looking for new projects. So if you have anything for us, then please talk to me. Um, I make a living as a senior solution architect. I also help uh, startups, for example, as a CTO, um, and also some coaching. I've been active in the Python community for a very, very long time. Did lots of things. I'm a core developer, um, Bureau Python Society fellow, Python Software Foundation fellow, and I also founded a user group that we have in Düsseldorf in Germany. So. Let's assume that you want to build the next big thing, right? So let's say another Facebook, another Google, another Amazon. Um, and you, you have this great startup idea, but you don't know really where to start. Although you have to have uh, a picture of where you, where you might be heading. So you have to plan ahead to be able to scale up and, for example, take lots and lots of orders if they come in, or take lots and lots of requests coming in. So you have to architect your solution in a way that actually scales up very easily. So you don't get into bottlenecks, you don't run into any walls during your development, um, and you have to pay attention to a number of things. I listed some of these things on this slide. So. First of all, scalability, I already uh, talked about that. It, you have to horizontally scale, which means that you have to take as many requests as possible. You also have to be able to scale vertically, so you have to basically be able to, to adjust your stack to new requirements. If your solution is supposed to be you know, running for an enterprise, for example, then you have to prepare for the enterprise, and being um, enterprise compatible, means that you have to look into compliance, uh, observability, accountability, governance, all of these things. So that is something that you should keep in mind right from the start, and you should design your system in that way. Very important is observability. That is something that often comes as a hindsight. Observability basically means that you try to uh, make it possible to look into how your system operates, how it works. Um, at, you, you need to look into that at, at runtime, so you need to be able to, to connect to your application and see what it's doing, but you also need to keep logs of everything that's been done for auditing purposes later on. So that's observability, that's very important. I'm mentioning this because this is one of the um, weak points of event-driven architectures. So there are two architectures that you all probably know. How many of you know REST? Pretty much everyone. GraphQL, almost everyone. That's good. So both of these architectures are what I call synchronous, because uh, essentially what you, what you do is you call from your front end to the back end. You wait for the request, and uh, then you get the data back. You get the data back in two different ways. REST is basically um, statically defined, so every, every API that you, you call there has a certain, uh, returns a certain number of types. Uh, whereas, and, and a certain number of uh, data, whereas GraphQL is much more flexible. It's, it's, it's a lot more um, like, for example, talking to a database on the server side. So you can, it's very flexible when it comes to doing queries. And so it takes away a lot of the complexities that you have with REST if you have a constantly changing database schema in the back end. So if you want to start something new, REST is always good for, for simple things. GraphQL is, is excellent if you have this use case where data schemas can change. Both are difficult to scale, though. If you want to you know, go to some kind of like Google or Facebook kind of scale, then this is really, really hard. And then comes event-driven architectures, EDA. So EDA is different in that it's asynchronous. So it's not like you, you send a request somewhere and you get something back right away and you can wait for it. Um, it works completely event-driven, as the name says. So you, you have an event, 
the event gets handled by many different systems that listen for these events, and then these systems can react on that event and generate new events. And so what typically happens is that you have a front end that talks to a back end. The back end could then be REST or could be GraphQL, but it's not actually doing the, actual, the, the processing that's behind that request. It only takes that, that request and then generates an event. And then your, your event-driven architecture then goes and processes this event. All kinds of different subsystems talk to this, uh, the, the endpoint that you have there. Um, and no, sorry, wrong. It generates the event, and then the, the, um, the endpoint waits for, for the final message to come back to that endpoint to, to return something to the user. That's a better explanation. So uh, the nice thing, as I already mentioned, is that you can combine it with REST and GraphQL, so you don't need to have your whole system designed like that. You don't need to have your front end generate these events. Um, and you can very easily integrate with existing systems that have a REST or GraphQL interface. The nice thing here with, with EDA is that it's very, very easy to extend, it's very easy to scale up because you can just add more technology that's listening to these events. It's also very easy to replace certain parts in your system because there's no tight coupling, it's all loosely coupled. So you just need to have or make sure that these new systems, they understand these events and react accordingly. It's actually very old uh, architecture. It was, well, at least that's the first time I heard it, it was uh, in, in the 2000s, may actually be even older than that. Um, and it was part of an architecture called SOA, service-oriented architecture. That was uh, a hot thing at that time. How many of you know event-driven architectures? Very few, so that's, that's good. So I might actually tell you about something that's new. You may not be aware, but you're actually probably all using event-driven architectures as a user already. Because if you look at the, your, your OS, all the, the UI technology in your OS is actually event-driven. And if you're ordering on you know, services like Amazon, then same thing, everything is event-driven. So this slide shows the, the main concepts of event-driven architecture. So of course, everything has to communicate with each other. You have producers that produce events, and you have uh, consumers that consume events. You typically have a broker in between those two so that you make sure that the communication actually works. And there are various ways of how these consumers can uh, listen to events and how these producers can uh, put events into the system. In order to make, thing, to make sure that, that everything gets handled properly, you typically organize the events and topics. And as I said, everything is fully asynchronous. So um, no one is waiting for anyone. Uh, and you can, you can just have all the, the consumers just do, just look on, on that topic for, and watch for new events. And then they can just take the events and uh, process them and do something with them. So events are typically, in, in an actual implementation of the architecture, are typically implemented as messages. And, and the, the type of messages that you can expect is, for example, something happened, or a state change somewhere, or you can have initiate a command. This is very different from what you have in, in typical kind of um, these, these queue system structures, like, for example, uh, if you use Apache Kafka, then typically what you do is you process data. You don't process things like commands, for example. You don't process or necessarily process things like a state change. But you just want to take data and you want to process it and then put it somewhere, maybe act on it. The message, messages themselves, they cannot be very large because you want to be very efficient. So you encode them, you typically also uh, compress them. And whenever you have something that's bulk data, like you know, images or voice files or videos or whatever, then uh, you would pr typically manage those in external storage. For the encoding that you use uh, on these messages, you have a number of common formats that are being used. The, the most uh, common one is the Apache Avro format, which is the default for Kafka. I'm going to explain what Kafka is a bit later. Um, it's one of the brokers. 
But there can also be other uh, types of you know, messages. For example, you can have JSON. You need to be sh make sure that everything is, is nicely typed and also ideally signed, because you want to make sure that your whole infrastructure internally is secure. And because uh, you want to have traffic, you know, not, not generate any bottlenecks, compression is also something that you can use to speed things up. Now, how do these messages go from one end to the other? So like I said, everything can be organized in topics, and then you can have, you have two different mechanisms of how to manage the distribution of these messages. A very popular one is a publish subscribe or pub sub. How many of you know that one? Lots, okay, so I don't have to go into details, that's great. Um, there is one downside with publish subscribe is that messages cannot be resent to new subscribers. So if a subscriber um, enters or you know, subscribes to a certain topic later on, they won't see the, his the history of messages. And that's something that a second type of distribution um, handles, which is called streaming. So in the streaming case, the broker actually stores or buffers messages for a certain amount of time. And so you can basically look back at messages that had already been sent earlier on. And so it is possible to, for consumers to subscribe to a channel and then see what's already been in the queue and then maybe take older messages from that queue and, and work on those. It also enables automatic replay, uh, which is nice in case of errors. Let's say something goes wrong, then you might want to replay a certain number of messages. This whole architecture then introduces the, the decoupled sending and receiving, so you, you don't have to have the producers actually know who consumes their messages, and likewise you don't have the consumers know about who produces messages. So this may sound a bit awkward, but it actually the, the consumers are only interested in the types of messages they're getting. They're not really interested in who is sending them, right? So you have two things that, um, I don't know if you can see that, it says, says at the bottom, it says separation of concerns and encapsulation. Those are two design um, goals that you would typically want to have in your architecture. So what kinds of message brokers can you have? Um, the most popular one, I guess, is Apache Kafka, but there are lots and lots of others as well. Apache Kafka is basically a, a messaging system where you put in data, it's extremely fast, and uh, it, it then you know, disseminates the data to subscribers, for example. You can also set it up in a streaming way um, so that you can handle both of the cases that I showed here. If you are more into specific protocols, for example, AMQP, which is uh, used in finance a lot, uh, you can use RabbitMQ for this. If you're more into IoT, then MQTT is a good protocol for that, and you have Apache ActiveMQ for this, or if you want to start, well, very small, then you can use Mosquito, which is a Python implementation of this. And of course, you have the cloud providers. They, they all provide some kind of pub sub uh, interface or um, even more basic technology as uh, AWS, SNS. There are some older variants as well, and this is basically how I learned about this architecture. It's uh, called IBM MQ series. Does anyone know that one? Yeah, very few, interesting. This was uh, used in banking a lot, and I, around the, the, the 2000s, um, many banks basically processed all the transactions through MQ series because it provided certain um, securities around how you process messages. And this is on the next slide, because implementing a broker and likewise selecting a broker is something that needs to be carefully done. So you want to make sure that all the messages actually do get delivered, right? That's one thing that's very important. You also want to make sure that every, process, or every message gets processed exactly once and not multiple times. So let's say you order something on Amazon, you don't want to get everything twice, right? Failure modes are very important because something, of course, will fail. In all you know, dynamic systems, something will eventually fail. You have network issues, you have processes not working correctly, you have, I don't know, backends going down. Um, so you need to make sure that the, the broker can help you with these failure modes. And you need to figure out which message size to use. So you need to figure out whether to put the actual data into the message or not, whether maybe you just put a reference into the message. Um, and that's a trade-off. You know, the bigger the, me the messages get, the slower your system. 
And the, the downside with putting references in there is that all the different actors in that system will then have to go to these, um, you know, the, the fixed storage, the S3 or whatever, or database, and actually get the data before they can start processing. Now, another big thing is that you need to tell everyone about how these, these messages get processed and, and which messages are available and which producers and consumers actually do create these messages. And there's a standard for this, which is very much like the Open API standard. Do you know the Open API standard? This is basically something that was developed for REST. It was called Swagger before. It's uh, machine readable, which is very nice, so you can actually have discovery in your system. Um, and Async API was, was created to basically follow this kind of standard, except that it's, it's adapted to async processing and publish subscribe, so you can, you can see what's, what um, the consumers and producers, uh, what they provide, and you can look into the types, you can look into the messages, the types of messages that they send. It's a relatively new standard, Unfortunately, it's mostly Node.js and Java based, so Python does not have a uh, you know, big role in it, and that's you know, also part of why I'm talking at the conference about this, because I would really like Python to have a bigger story in this async API. Um, but yeah, let's do a recap of the architecture. So event-driven architecture is really actually quite easy to understand, I think. You can split applications and loosely couple components, which is very nice for scalability purposes, and you can easily scale up and scale down everything. As you see there on the, on the right, um, you have a REST back, you still have a REST backend, but the REST backend doesn't actually process anything anymore. It just creates messages and takes messages. And then you have something called an order manager in there, uh, which then makes sure that all these messages get properly uh, processed, and also that all the different stages that you have in there um, are, you know, um, create message, take messages, re return messages, and then it also sends back to the, the rest backend uh, the, re the reply. Now I have to check the time. I have seven minutes left. Um, okay, I have to speed up this a bit. Um, I wanted to compare REST and GraphQL uh, versus EDA, so let's, let's just quickly run through an order that you have in a web shop. So first, the, the REST GraphQL interface, it's, it's synchronous. Um, the, the backend system that you have, the web backend, uh, has to talk to lots of different subsystems in such a, an order system. So you have a payment system, fulfillment, inv inventory, uh, queue order, handling, delivery, what are, uh, many more probably, some fraud detection system maybe. The problem with that is that all these these different subsystems then have to be communicated with directly from that particular backend. Uh, and that has to happen every single time you, you get a request. Now, if, if one of these subsystems goes down, then of course the whole request goes down. If, if you want to update one of these subsystems uh, with, you know, let's say a new data structure, then you always have to go to the, your web backend and then update that as well. So it creates more downtime if you do these things. Um, and there are, you know, challenges with, uh, with handling failures, uh, with handling, you know, changes. If you have a single point of failure, basically, in your, um, in your front end, and ideally you don't want that. So how does EDA work? EDA is more flexible in this respect, as long as you have one of these order management systems sitting um, in front of this and then managing all these different events. You can easily scale up and scale down all the different components. So let's say you get lots of requests to the inventory service, then uh, you can just you know, add more workers uh, that list are listening to these messages, and then you, your whole system then scales up. Code management is also distributed, so you can make changes to the different parts in your system without actually affecting the web shop. And that's very nice because uh, you can also handle upgrades much easier. You just, you know, you put up new workers that have the new code and then you slowly shut down the, the existing workers that are still working. Um, and so everything is nice. Um, there are some challenges, of course. I mean, every, every architecture, every system has some downsides, right? So one of the big downsides, as I mentioned early on, was is the, the debugging of these systems because everything is dynamic everything uh, can, can happen at, at undetermined times and without necessarily keeping the same order. You have to you know, 
make sure that everything gets locked properly, you have to ideally have a central lock server that takes all these locks so that you can, you can reconstruct uh, processing later on for debugging purposes. And there's another thing that's the organizational challenges. Because everything is decoupled, it's very likely that in a larger organization, you will also have different teams working on these things. And so you need to make sure that the organization communication is working properly. An async API is something that really helps with this because it documents how things work, what uh, the different services expect, what they send, uh, and it makes it much easier to communicate things. So second part, and that has to be really quick. Unfortunately, there's also not, not too much I can tell you about this, except that <coughs> Python async support is absolutely fantastic for PubSub kind of interfaces, and uh, I'm really glad that we have this now in Python. If you have something that is not async compatible, it's always possible to, to use uh, threads to then you know, talk to external libraries that may not uh, support async, uh, so that's not really a big, a, a big issue. And these external libraries don't need the gil, so you don't, also don't have any gil kind of um, challenges. So what about this, this documentation uh, specification async API? Well, there isn't much. Um, to say the least. And the async API community itself has too much focus on Java and uh, Node.js, so we should really do something about this. There's a tool called async API that does have some support for Python, but it's really simple, and it just works for MQTT uh, kind of installations, like you know, small home assistant kind of uh, technology. So it's not really up for scale, so basically you cannot use it. Everything has to be handwritten. Um, there is some support on PyPI. There are two packages I found. One is the more general one is async uh, API package that helps you with uh, reading these specs and then uh, providing APIs. And then it's another one that uh, provides ways of publishing this kind of spec to your internal network so that you have introspection and discovery. But both of these developments have stalled. I don't know what's happening with there. So perhaps we need something new. Uh, on the good side, it, the, the different systems that I talked about, the different broker systems, they all have interfaces in Python, all of them. And these are used a lot. So it's definitely possible to roll your own and to work with these directly. So you, you don't have to rely on these async API modules being available. You can just tap into this directly. And this is also currently being used. So conclusion. Roll your own is definitely possible and is also used by a lot of companies. We do need better support for EDA in Python. We need more people working with the async API specification organization so that we get a foot in the door there. Um, and we also need more uh, support in you know, popular interfaces that we have in Python to, to help us with this. Right, and so the main takeaway is never stop to learn. I hope you learned something in the talk, maybe a bit at least. Um, and always try new things, because there's lots out there, lots to be discovered. And um, I often have the feeling that we're a bit of you know, living in a bubble in the Python world. Um, we're not looking outside, for example. We're not looking at all the great Java stuff that's out there. Like if you go to the Apache Software Foundation project page, there's so many projects there using Java. It's great software, and most of these projects have Python interfaces. So, you know, do have a look around and shop around. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? We have time for questions. And can we please line up here for questions, please? Hi, thank you for a great speech. Um, what I always struggling with, with that kind of architecture, is that UI usually is not asynchronous, but synchronous. And let's say that case when you make an order, for example, in Amazon. Uh, so what you should return to the user, because you put an order, but you don't know it's going to happen or not, because there are a lot of events happening in the background. So I cannot just tell the user that the user was Place because I'm not sure about it. So, how to solve these kind of situations in the on the UI part actually? 
so on on the UI part, typically what you can do is you can you know um, show that something is being processed. Uh, if you, for example, go to one of these shops like Amazon, for example, or, or Zalando or whatever, um, the, the processing typically happens so fast that you don't, as a user, you don't really notice that you know something is going on in, in the back and which is actually asynchronous, but it happens so fast so it appears to be synchronous. If you if you do something else, like for example, you you book a hotel or you book a flight, then you actually typically see that something is happening and you have to wait for the processing to finish. And what they typically do is they you know, entertain the user in some way, show how many you know, hotels they're searching, how many flights they're searching, these kinds of things, right? What's happening in the background is asynchronous as well, so it also uses these kinds of event driven so, architectures. So you would say that uh, on the backend side you just wait for the final message? Yeah, Most you, of the cases? You, for, I mean, for very long-running things, like for example, in, in, in finance you often have, uh, I'm, I'm working a lot in finance, in finance you have uh, lots of uh, reporting batch jobs that are run, and they usually take hours, right? So what, in that case, what you do is you just you notify the user by sending an email or a message to Slack or whatever uh, to then pick up the, the request, uh, the report. Um, maybe one short question also about the PostgreSQL, because I was interested about it, how it works there actually, that uh, subscribe. Yeah, uh, you, if you have to look at the, the Postgres documentation, it has a PubSub interface as well. So you can actually use Postgres as a broker. So it, it creates like events in a database somehow? It creates events that you can listen to and then act upon, yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my question is um, how to deal with uh, lost messages or uh, lost confirmation of the messages that something was successfully processed and how do you even track the state and maybe do the repetitions because the, a user really doesn't really care what happened in the background because it, there was a synchronous, a synchronous, but they really don't want to see double bookings or confirmation that the booking was successful even though it was not because of some internal glitch in the broker or wherever, uh, what strategies do you utilize to uh, handle this? Um, that's a very good question. What you typically do is, I mean, if you want to do, analyze later on if you had any lost messages, of course you do logging and then you, uh, you try to analyze the logs. Uh, if you want to inform the user about, you know, a process not, not really working out, then uh, the, you if you have like an order system, you can use this order manager to then inform the user about a problem in the system. And you can also have uh, an order manager roll back that transaction so that you don't have any double bookings. Unfortunately, this doesn't always work. I mean, I've had that experience myself a number of times. I, I booked a flight and then it you know, didn't happen. So, um, and I tried again and you know, it, I wasn't sure whether I now had two, two tickets or just one ticket. So basically I had to call up support for that. So this is something that not always works out uh, in, an, in, in an ideal way, but you can certainly make it work if you have um, extra systems that protect against this. But it doesn't come out of the box. You have to uh, you know, actually implement this and think about it. That's the most important part. Okay, thank you. Hi, yeah, good, great talk. Um, how do you handle time-based events, like things that aren't necessarily triggered by an action from the user? Do you have a timed schedule? events, like you know, do something every every day at 3 p.m. That kind of thing, or yeah. So we use uh, event-driven architectures to manage like long-running processes, and sometimes, like for example, like in energy, a user comes on supply on a certain date, and we need something to happen at midnight on that date. Right. You can. Um, <laughs> what you can <laughs> do struggle. is. Uh, I'm not, actually, I'm not aware of, of uh, these brokers handling you know, the situation where you put in an event and you give it a time and then you say, okay, this event should only go into that topic at that point in time. That's actually a good thing. I would have to research that, whether that's possible or not. Yeah, I'd love um, to chat with you about that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the great talk. I have a question about the stability of uh, um, event-driven architecture. Uh, what should we use like, uh, in terms of end-to-end um, -end testing and in, uh, integ integrational testing? So for end-to-end -end testing, you can, if you have a web front end, it's, it's typically best to just start with that web front end and, and put all the requests in via the web front end. And then 
you can you can uh, have checks in the, in the back end that that events are actually being processed and you can you can use that kind of approach for testing i would always recommend to do the testing both uh, end to end so both using the web front end uh, all the way to you know what what happens in the in the back ends where you check whether something actually got triggered but also have uh, full testing of course in each component that you have in your architecture right so a good way to start with this, uh, for example, is to basically do, to, to start writing tests from top, from the, the, the top level, so basically going in from the web, and also from, from the bottom level, where you basically make sure that all the different low-level operations that you have in your components work. All right. Uh, that's it for all the event-driven questions. Let's thank Mark andre again, and he will be available offline to chat. Right. Thank you.